Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler and a very, very warm welcome to the channel. Before I get cracking, I just wanted to say that I have opened up a separate page on Facebook to add all the games I feature on the Top Chess Engine Championship this year. Just type in your main browser, Top Chess Engine Competition, and it should come up. The TSEC Season 10 of the Stage 1 Round 4 games ended yesterday, and one huge problem many people may have is this. Whether certain opening lines that have been chosen by the organisers are fair in the first place. We know a one move opening like a knight to a three move is a bad move and this is why you never get to see it. And the same applies if you see the other knight opening with h3. The game of round four between Almighty Stockfish and Ginkgo is going to raise some eyebrows because the opening the engines were set up to go for in itself is very questionable. So let's go and see not just the opening, but the entire game. The game was set up from this position. We have one white pawn on d4. Really? Yeah, that's correct. And two black pawns, one on c5 and one on e5. And this is how the position is reached. d4, c5, d5, and now e5. And this has to be wrong for black because white has a huge advantage. Just ignore for now that the white pawn made two moves in a row when it comes to the principal rules of chess because in this case, once black has pushed both of his pawns forward, this pawn on d5 is so strong and cannot even be threatened. The only move white needs is either c4 or e4, and both serve exactly the same purpose. Stockwish went for e4 here, and now e6. What e6? What am I talking about? d6, locking in these central pawns. The game progressed through the bishop coming out, just to anticipate a likely knight move to f6, without the need to get the knight out to c3. Of course, white can always pin the knight, but this is not what this opening is all about. I think I forgot to mention what this opening is all about anyway. Okay, let's turn back very fast. This position here is the famous Old Benoni. And I think the organizers wanted to see how the engines perform using this specific opening, but I think they have it all out of context. Why not let the engines play their own game and force the two move opening rule on them. Is anyone who is anyone here who agrees with me? I'm sure I'm going to hear from you. Back to the game. Okay, with a very quick point we made about this likely knight pin on f6, the knight chose to go for e7. But is this a relatively restrictive move? Maybe it is because it paralyzes this dark colored bishop or shall I say the dark colored squared bishop? Well, you know what I mean. After the knight was developed to f3, the knight repositioned itself right away, allowing some extra space for this bishop on f8. But even he hasn't got much room to maneuver because of his own pawn on d6. And here is where Stockfish lashes out his pawn to h4, and we don't need to guess what his next move is going to be. Now, black can do this in two different ways. A direct h5, or getting his bishop out to e7, which is a far better tactical move, because if now white attacks the knight, this knight can now penetrate into white's camp without any fear of being lost. Though h5 would have been a very interesting move to go for. Stockfish held back and went for g3. And with this very move, we know that white is not likely to castle kingside. With black having now castled, Stockfish calculated it was the opportune moment to attack this knight, and so he did. And the problem now with this h5 move, we don't have h4 anymore, 
and this explains perfectly why that G3 move was made in the first place. The knight landed on the only safe square he could, but when was it last time you ever saw a knight seeking refuge on this square? The position for black already looks like, I don't know, there is something so wrong about it. This is not a knight on the rim who scream, but a knight on the edge that is about to be dredged. With this knight being completely out of play, Stockfish developed his other knight, and now this bishop on c8 came out and pinned the knight on f3. Stockfish was having none of this, and returned the bishop to e2, just in case. And now what? Any ideas what we're looking for in 2, 1, and pause? f5, and this is exactly what Ginkgo went for. And here all hell breaks loose. Knight h4 led to the exchange of the bishops first, and that was the turn of both the knight and the bishop. And right after that, these two central pawns came off too. And what a way to allow the knight to come out and make himself useful. After queen g4, Ginkgo needs to move his king just to be able to deal with his h6 move. And we know now from our previous game between Chiron and Johnny what a menace these pawns can be on the h-file when there is a kingside castle. Any ideas what Stockfish went for here? I'm not going to ask you to go through the 2-1 and pause because I'm not even convinced this was the best move to go for in this game. But what the heck, <laughs> let's try it anyway. Because it is a very interesting move. So here we go, two, one, and pause, h6. And now we need to look closely why such a move was initiated. Any ideas? If you take this pawn with a knight, the bishop is going to come in and eat up this knight. And after this pawn retakes, the rook is all you need to take this pawn. And whatever you try is going to be hopeless. If we consider a queen move to d7, or even this, queen e7, from here it will be child's play. All white needs is to go for castles, and even with the rook challenge on the queen, after the queen lines herself up on the age file, knight d7 is going to do very little when the rook occupies this square on e6. Forcing the queen out, let's say if the queen goes here, once the knight hits hard on d6, black can only respond with this rook move to g7, just to be able to stop the knight from coming in with a killer check on f7. But there is nothing stopping this knight from repositioning on f5, and it's game over. If the knight attacks the queen, she only needs to back off, and if now the rook gets in on g6 to protect the attack on the knight, rook h1 is very clear. Ginkgo avoided all this by simply not engaging. The engine pushed his pawn to g6, and this is just a near replica of our previous game. Of course, the position is very different, but it's all about the position of this pawn on h6, really. And just like our previous game, it is this pawn who's going to be the main problem for black. After the bishop made way for a possible queenside castle, the knight was now developed, allowing the queen to occupy this very interesting place on the board. Queen c7 was aimed to allow the rook to get active, and by this I meant the rook can now go right after the queen. And here is where I want you to sit down, pause, relax, and take as much time as you need to fish out Stockfish's next move. So I'm going to shut up for a few secs and return when you are ready to unpause. Okay, we're back. What did you come up with? Has anyone gone for this knight to f6 move? It is not a very bad move, but just take back this move and try again. Has anyone looked at this move? Bishop a5. 
Yes? No? If you went for this move, take it back again and try another move. Have you gone for a queenside castle? That's a very decent move, but uncastle and go once again. The move you really need here is very deep and I'm not even sure our best chess players can ever work it out. This move is rook f4 and this very move brings chess to a completely different level. But I guess once the pawn takes this rook, a pawn that has been lured to take the rook, having now abandoned his post on e5, Stockfish now came in with a check giving Ginkgo a huge headache. The engine can bring the knight to e5 to cover or the king can move out of the check. Any ideas on what to go for here? Well, once we go through at least one of the options open to us, we will know exactly what move must be played. Let's try with this one first. Does the knight to e5 work? No, because this allows the queen to come in with a renewed check and once the king gets out to g8, there you go. And always when you hear those arrows being fired, they always hit bullseye. So now that we know this is not a good way going about defending, the king got out to g8. In fact, this is the only option. And now what? Any takers in two, one and pause. And the only reason why I'm asking you to do this is because if you don't try and just see the moves, you will not learn. And you know what we say, practice makes perfect. The move you're looking for is queen takes knight. And once the queen arrests the knight, the knight comes in with a nice fork and collects the black queen in turn. But if you think this is it, just look at the board. Collecting the queen comes in with additional benefits because of this discovered check through the bishop on c3. Mind you, this is how the game unfolded. And after the knight stepped out to block, the knight grabbed the rook and right after the recapture, Though the pawn on g3 can easily remove this pawn, Stockfish went for a king move just to be able to free up his rook. So when the pawn picked up the pawn on g3, Stockfish traded in his bishop for the knight and what this move does in particular is to break open the center for this pawn on d5 to walk. After the g-pawn retired from the game, Forget about any check on f2. Ginkgo made a king move to allow him to get freer. And now with the rook getting into the game, we saw rook f5, g4. Rook f4, and once these two pawns came off, c3, a vital move to prevent the black rook from coming in with a check. After rook f4, d6. Rook back to f8. Rook back to f8. I beg your pardon. Rook back to f6. And rook d5. The rook rushed all the way back to the 8th rank. This move allows Stockfish to eat up another pawn. And with the rook coming in on d8, it was all about tactics. King e3 led to a6. Rook c7, rook takes, a rook check, king f8, rook takes, a rook check, king d4, and now king go went for it. But after the rook grabbed another pawn, g4 looked like black was going to make it because there's no way Stockfish can stop black from promoting. A rook check, push the king to f7, and now the pawn moved up a square. A rook check got the king closer to the rook. And now with the rook getting in place, Stockfish has it all under control. The engine pushed on with b4. And after rook h4 and rook g8, the end was a breath away. 
once the threat on promotion from these two pawns on the H and G files was down to zero, we saw rook H6, and once his position was reached, we saw that education rule kick in once again, passing on the full point to Stockfish. A very, very interesting game, a very exciting game, and boy, what moves his engines can make. The highlight of this game was here, and let me just bring it up for you. Here. And once the pawn took the rook, it was all over for black. But the biggest question from them all to ask is whether this old Benoni opening was something that set up Ginkgo for failure. And what would have been more interesting is to see Stockfish playing this old Benoni with the black pieces instead of white and then see how the engine responds and reacts to this game. Any thoughts are most welcome and I'm sure something is going to come out of this because we all want to see a fair championship and I don't think the choice of certain openings is a good way to go about this competition. Of course, the reason why these opening lines are tested is to allow engines to play different games and to avoid the same old ways of the very popular lines we see all the time. Anyhow, there is of course much, much more to come. And on this note, many thanks for taking part if you did, and many thanks for watching something I know you did do. This was your Chess Puzzler.